Welcome to the 5 Podcast. If you've listened before, thanks for coming back. If this is your first time, co-host Randy Shrewsbury and I, we're both former police officers who turn a critical lens to policing and attempt to have an ongoing conversation about the criminal justice system and the reform that's taking place with the people behind that change. So the activists, authors, practitioners, academics, and people who've been subject to the system. And all of these conversations have a focus on the problems that we face and how we can move forward and make positive change in the world. On this episode, we're really happy to talk with Heather Taylor. She's the former head of the Black Officers Union, the Ethical Society for Police in St. Louis, and also a former homicide detective. We talk about some of the challenges of navigating a career in law enforcement as a woman of color. We talk about her youth in St. Louis growing up, how she became an officer, some of the challenges and successes achieved during her career, about the current homicide crisis, crisis facing many of the cities in the United States, and then also about what comes next in her life, how she's going to leverage her experience to continue to have a positive impact in her community. If you want to help the podcast, the best way to help is to like, follow, subscribe, share the podcast on your social media platforms. And without anything further, thank you very much. Sit back and enjoy. So I introduced you before, uh, before we started talking here, but um, can you just maybe just tell us a little bit so we can get to know you a little bit? Can you maybe tell us where you grew up? Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up in North St. Louis, um, became a police officer with the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department in 2000, yeah, 2000, um, 9-11, 2000, uh, born and raised in St. Louis, and retired 9-25 of 20. Okay, those dates stand out to you. What? So what, uh, what led you to be a police officer? Was it, uh, did you have family members who'd been in policing or was it, uh, what, what sort of drew you and how did you become a police officer? How did that take place? Uh, so I have a family member that was a police officer when I was in high school, she was a police officer. Um, I also, you know, kind of more so from the standpoint of wanting to help and to help my community and violent crime in particular to hold people accountable for violent crime. And that included um, the person that, you know, my my brother murdered someone at 16 and my mother had to literally hold him down and have law enforcement arrive to arrest him. And it was kind of like my first experiences with accountability and knowing that my brother took a man away from his family and he had no right to do it. So from that standpoint, I understood at an early age how difficult uh, it is for victims of violence and that nobody has a right to shoot someone, to, to rape them, to hurt children, to hurt the el- elderly in particular. So that was my introduction and not so much that we trusted the system. My mom didn't trust the system, but my brother had to go into that system because he committed a crime. I also had an aunt who was murdered uh, by a deputy uh, marshal when I was a freshman in college. Uh, during the middle of the, the, the ending, the tail end of the school year. And um, he only got three years for her murder and wanted to do something to change that. Came into it with this naive uh, thought process that I could change this system. And, you know, that's basically why I became a police officer to help victims of violent crime and to stand up for those who are voiceless. And did you... Did you go after, was it after college? Did you, did you went to college before you became a police officer? Or? I went after. I went after um, and got, got hired by the police department, 9-11, 2000. I walked in the first day and my cousin was sitting there. I didn't know he applied uh, to college and we were the first two, I mean, applied to the police department. We were the first two um, college graduates, I think, in our, in our family, as a matter of fact. It's just, um, he was sitting there and, you know, that's how it started. And you, go ahead, well, I was going to say you had a, a hell of a one year anniversary, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so you went, when you became a police officer, how, how did people react? So you said like your mom sort of distrusted the system. Um, was there any pushback when you became, a, when you decided to take that path or was it encouraged? You know, I, the only pushback I had was with the um, guy that I was dating at the time. 
and we went to college together and he didn't trust police officers and he's like, well, I guess I'll be single. Um, I joined the police department. Um, my family was fine with it. Uh, my dad was fine with it. Uh, everybody was fine with me being a police officer. Uh, my grandmother was proud of it as well. So it, it was a, you know, we considered it a noble profession when, you know, they did their jobs the right way. And you said that you sort of, when you came into it, you had this expectation that you were going to be able to change the system. You sort of recognized some things you weren't, uh, that you thought were impermissible and you wanted to make change. But you oh. said that you were that kind of naive. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, you, you know, when you're young and you're a college student and you're, you know, you're just a little green. And even with me growing up in North St. Louis, um, just kind of naive thinking that, you know, one person could change the world. You know, I'm, I'm a believer, um, I'm Dr. King, and that's who my idol has been my, my whole, whole life. So, you know, that's one person that changed the world. And I believe that, but this system is so, um, it has so many imbalances that there's no way possible for one person to change it. And I came into it thinking that, you know, hey, we're all police officers. We're going to do what's right. People are going to stand up. I've been a fighter all my life. And I expected others to do the same and to follow. And that, that wasn't the case all the time. So. How long into your career did you start seeing this? Um, was, was it kind of insidious that grew over time? Or were you kind of hit, um, you know, very early with... Um, oh, that was a, that was a miscalculation. Um, early, uh, in the very beginning, uh, I remember, uh, the police academy, uh, having the police off St. Louis police officers association show up, the ethical society of police show up. Uh, I knew, uh, we were told immediately by the ethical society of police, if you're African-American, you're going to need us. It's, it's not a, a, a situation where you're not going to need us. It's when you're going to need us because you have this police association that's not going to represent you fairly as an African-American. There's going to be a time that you're going to need us because you're going to be mistreated. Uh, you knew that in the beginning. I remember having instructors speak about uh, the Black Panthers and clearly not understanding why the Black Panthers came about um, Dr. Um, I'm sorry, Malcolm X, and speaking, you know, about the, the community and kind of like it, in general terms, in like a roundabout way that I felt uh, at the time, it's like, hmm, something's not right about them. You know, um, they don't know what they're talking about. Clearly, you know, they weren't from my community. I grew up in North St. Louis, so I became a police officer from that neighborhood. So I know the ins and outs of my neighborhood. I know why. Uh, certain things have happened there. And you have these, these men, and they were mostly white men, or actually all white men, speaking uh, from the perspective of that community when you're not from that community. And they were um, condescending sometimes, I thought. And I remember not thinking one day, hmm, I don't know if I'm going to come back. Don't know if I'm going to come back. Went home, thought about, I was like, the hell if I'll let you know, somebody run me away. Uh, came back. And um, I remember standing up in front of the, the class and my classmates, some of my best friends now, you know, they kind of all laugh. We all laugh at it now, but it was like, hey, you know, I'm supposed to depend on you to save my life. And I can't even get along with you. You can't get along with anyone or you have problems with people over some of the most, you know, asinine things. And, you know, we're supposed to depend on each other. I knew then. And as my career progressed, I had, you know, sergeants. I remember one time I was out injured. I was in a foot pursuit. Um, I twisted uh, my ankle and I was on the desk, which is no, no place. Nobody wants to be on the desk because you're stuck there answering the phone. And I remember one of the, she's a lieutenant now. She got promoted. She's a lieutenant now. And, you know, she was speaking about, she was telling me how, um, how I talked. You know, she's like, oh, you're very articulate. Well, in my, from my world, when someone says that you're articulate, um, 
in in that breath, you're like, huh, yeah, that that's a microaggression right there. I know, you know, I knew them. I was like, what does that mean? Yeah, it's like coded language. You're like, oh, that's kind of that's the coded language. You know, we know what that means. So you you kind of knew, uh, and I remember. Uh, one of our colonels uh, who filed a reverse discrimination lawsuit and he actually won in the last few years. And I remember being, I went to him like, hey, what do I need to do to get into the South Patrol Detective Bureau? And I think I had two years on maybe. And um, he said, we already have a black female. You what? What what does that mean? You know, and that was kind of like my reaction to him. And it just kind of, uh, you weren't, they never prepared us for that. And luckily I had fight in me. <laughs> so, you know, my response is sometimes, I remember one of my very first days, uh, African-American sergeant walked up behind me. I, at the time, I'm tall, I'm six feet tall. At the time, I probably uh, maybe weighed a buck 50. And he just rubbed the back of my head and I turned around and I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Don't touch me. And he was like, oh, I thought you were someone else. And I'm like, hmm. I, I doubt that there are very many African-American females on the department that are six feet tall, thin and look like me. And you know, it, those are the things they don't prepare you for. And I came into it naive and I'm like, you know, I remember knowing that that was a violation, but how to go about it and who to go to to do it. I knew I couldn't go to the POA um, and I didn't understand that I could have gone to um, ethical and later I did, but it, it, you know, it was too late by then. So were, were any of your concerns, uh, you know, um, dismissed in, um, w- uh, with this notion and I, and I, I experienced it in the Academy. I've heard other officers have experienced it of where there would be this either, either microaggressions or, or, or even, or, you know, uh, scaled all the way up to just flat up you know, racist language or behavior, and it would be dismissed as, well, it's going to be worse on the street. So if you don't have, you know, tough enough skin here, you know, amongst us, you know, brethren, um, then then this is just going to be, you know, this is going to be indicative of, of, of you being weak and, and you know, uh, on the road. So you, you had that as well, but, you know, from where I come from, you, it was important to be strong because there were, I faced monsters sometimes in my own community, uh, walking home from school. Um, I remember I, I literally had to walk to school in the area, very area where a young girl was beheaded and they still haven't solved that crime. So, you know, you had to have a level of toughness. I remember walking home in the day that my mom made the decision that I would never walk to school and from school. Again, even though I was, what, 12, you know, that's old enough to walk by yourself to and from school. But uh, I remember in my own neighborhood, um, a man waving me down and telling me to come here. And just luckily I was an athlete and I took off running. I booked it and got to school. But so for me, you're talking about, you know, being tough. It was like, you know, I, I came into it with uh, thick skin. Um, and well, well, I, I mean more of, of, of did you experience like where they would just dismiss at hand um, uh, things under the guise of being, you know, that you got to be tough. Not, not so much about whether or not you individually were tough, but um, uh, uh, you, well, I think it, you know, it, it happened, but I can't give you like examples that stand out. Sure. Um, I know that, that that's, a, that's the norm, you, you know, you got to be tough. You got to, you, you know, you can't fall out of this run. You need to be tough or you, you could literally be hobbling. Uh, so, you know, that was the mentality. Uh, be tough and you, you got to have thicker skin. You got to be able to take it. I remember one of our firearms uh, instructors. I grew up in North St. Louis, but I'd never seen a gun in person or touched one until I became an officer. And uh, I remember he's gone now, but I remember him standing behind me. He was like, just shoot, just get it in the X. And, you know, and it was like, this guy's nuts. <laughs> like, it was like, it was like, whatever, man. Uh, and I shot, you know, I got it in the X, but I was like, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, that that's part of 
that culture uh, that you do have to be tough. You need to get tougher. You have to, you know, you, you have to shoot better. You have to, it, I guess it did, it, looking back at it now as we're talking, I guess it did have an effect on me because I'm, uh, I'm an expert shooter now. <laughs> uh, and I, I kind of, I, even now, as you see, I laugh at, you know, this idiot it, yelling. It's like, well, you know, I grew up with bullets. I grew up uh, with people who were, you know, in our neighborhood who were um, being shot at, who were being murdered. And, you know, you yelling um, in the back of me and telling me to be tougher or telling anyone around, it's like, man, you don't know what tough he is. <laughs> so some people might not be familiar with St. Louis. Can you, so you, so you investigated homicides and led mm -hmm. a, a, a team that investigated homicides for a, a long period of time. Can you talk about just comp compared to maybe other parts of the country, what is uh, is there? What is the violence problem in, in St. Louis, especially the North Side? Yeah, so North St. Louis is predominantly African American. Uh, what you have in St. Louis, you have this thing called the Del Mar Divide. So north of Del Mar, um, lower home values, mostly African American, um, lower income, a lot of poverty. South of Del Mar, the, the the home values are you know triple probably um, easily. Uh, it's perceived differently. And I grew up in North St. Louis, you know, north of Del Mar, and in those areas, you had a lot of crime. Uh, probably not even probably not as much as you have right now, I guess, uh, when I was growing up. But it was pretty bad considering um, you know the time frame and high crime, high drugs, a lot of poverty, over-policing uh, as well, uh, things like that. And, it, and just like when you look at it on a map, like if you look at a crime map in St. Louis or you're like driving in St. Louis or on a bus in St. Louis, it's really stark. I found it really mm -hmm. shocking moving here um, because if you look like, if you look at a map, you can just see where there's this, this line that literally runs down Delmar and then when you go out into the community, you see that there's this there's this gentrified neighborhoods to the south where there's been a substantial amount of, of investment. And then when you go north across Del Mar, like you're there are these big vacant lots, uh, housing that's falling down, you know, just all the signs of these signs of poverty and, and lack of investment. And then uh, and it pays a toll when you look like in terms of human lives, like. I think right now St. Louis has the highest homicide rate in the country. Am I right? Per capita, yes. Right, per per capita, and and a lot of the reason that the numbers are kind of skewed is because they don't include the county, right? Is that kind yes, of the problem? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it kind of gives you this impression that St. Louis is way more violent than all these other countries, but in reality, it's because they've really sort of boxed it in, mm -hmm. like turned it into this really small kind of space. Um, sorry, to, sorry to go on. I just, I just find it fascinating that that it could be so. Because you imagine in a, in a in a in a city that things that there would be these slight changes over time and space as you move through, but it's just it's so stark in St. Louis. What do you what do you attribute that to? I think most um, problems begin with poverty. A lot of violence begins with uh, poverty. Uh, what you have in St. Louis is that you have um, areas in, in large pockets of poverty. Uh, there are very few businesses, um, very few opportunities for uh, advancement and um, meaning, um, you know, real estate, things that are new, that are, that are new to North St. Louis versus, versus central uh, areas, downtown, um, other neighborhoods. And so I think that's, you know, it's indicative of, of, of what you get when you have um, a high level of poverty. You're gonna have vacant buildings, you're gonna have crime, you're gonna have drug use, you're gonna have a lot of factors that um, play into that. And that's what you have. Yeah, to tons of, like, because when you drive through, you can see these um, buildings that during the 60s and 50s were used for manufacturing and like shipping, you see these, cool these really cool architecture these some really great buildings um that have just been they were abandoned you know in the seven like mostly in this like the 70s with yeah. this like the deindustrialization and there was never anything like to fill the gap you know um so it's uh, it's 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 really really sad um so so the, you've mentioned a couple times the Eth ethical society of police and you, you were 
introduced to them when you were at the academy. Can you can you talk a little bit more more about that? Like, was that something that the how, how that came about? Do you know? Were did they have to fight to get permission to go into the academy, or uh, do you know how that how that happened? Um, yeah, I don't. I think, you know, we started off, Ethical was founded officially in 1972 is because of um, a riots, riots that were race related uh, for white police officers assaulted um, an African-American, two African-American men. And the four officers were put on desk duty by the board of police commissioners. And ultimately, Um, The officers from the St. Louis Police Association staged a blue flu saying, you know, over 600 plus officers said they weren't going to work. And those four officers were ultimately returned uh, to the uh, patrol. And so ethical came about from that. And then during that time, they uh, endorsed um, a candidate um, for president who was obviously uh, a racist. You know, I forget if I don't know if it was Wallace or not um, at the time. Um, I always forget that for some reason, but it was a candidate for president that clearly believed in, you know, slavery, Confederacy and things of that nature. And this was the president to be the president of the police. The United States. Oh, oh, so someone running for to be president of the United States. And you don't remember who that, who? who I believe it was, it was Wallace. Okay, Wallace. Wallace. And um, so you had African-Americans who, Oppose that, and you also you had these numerous incidents of racial bias that were problematic, and so ethical was founded. Uh, this was in the late '60s, but officially in 1972 we came about, and it was to represent African American officers and to be a voice in our community for African Americans who were um, victims of um, crime uh, at the hands of police officers. So, you know, that's how we we came about and that's how Ethical was founded. So um, the police association was recognized as the, I guess the, now they're recognized as a labor, the bargaining entity, the sole bargaining entity. Uh, However, we've been around since the seventies fighting them tooth and nail um, for everything. So we do everything that they do. It's like, yeah, yeah, we're not going, you're not going to refuse us. You're not going to tell us we can't go to the police academy and talk to recruits and explain why we exist and why you exist. Uh, so they, they don't, um, they haven't, you know, they haven't challenged that. I think they kind of, they know better, please. What, what, what was the administration uh, welcoming of ethical? Um, I mean, I know, I know the unions, um, uh, you know, can often be the the loudest voice in the room, right? And you know, we see this in New York and Minneapolis and Chicago, where not always are the unions um, uh, really reflective of 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 the you know the uh, frontline officers. Um, but but did the how was ethical? received in the agency and then by the administration aside from the union? Um, no, you had, uh, yeah, um, like our previous chief, uh, uh, old, I remember when O'Toole became the chief and he had his administrator, interim chief in 2017 for that brief stint, thank goodness. Um, it was only that amount of time because can you imagine if he was here longer, uh, you had uh, his, his aide uh, reached out to us and said, to us, yeah, you were the first organization, you know, we wanted to meet with, um, I want to meet with you guys first, you reached out to me, and they understand that if they do something, especially when I was a president or Eddie Simmons was a president, uh, if you do something that violates the law policy, that you better, it it better be tight to you. You better keep it tight to you and and not let us find out about it Um, because we're going to fight you in closed doors. We're gonna fight you outside of those closed doors publicly anywhere that we can. And so that level of, um, we know that they, when they made decisions in internal affairs and like, oh, I wonder what, it's common knowledge they would say, you know, I wonder what ethical is going to say. You know, we have to think about what we're going to do. We wonder what ethical is going to say. Um, but in that same, you know, breath, they would still do something corrupt and we would, you know, expose it. And you're like, it, it, it you know, we are 
respected, but at the same time um, valued? No, absolutely not, no. I think um, when we prosecuted our former president in 2015, the black Darren Wilson, uh, when we prosecuted him, I remember testifying in court against him and having the police officers association approach us and say, you know, why don't you guys let us absolve ethical? You become the, like, if you guys don't get the hell out of our faces right now, that's never going to happen. You've never stood up for black officers. You didn't stand up for, Luther Hall who was your member. Luther Hall wasn't a member of Ethical. We lobbied on his behalf harder than they did. Uh, they never lobbied. They never lobbied for Milton Greens, uh, these officers that they've had. And, and this is after, you know, me telling them, you know, you're nuts. Get out of my face. Um, it, this and this is, so this is times where they've, where you've had black officers that needed assistance and they yeah, didn't. Yeah. Can you, the, can you maybe yeah. give us an example of, of something? Uh, like oh, that? yeah. Look, uh, just Luther Hall's case, uh, you know, this, this settlement for $5 million, you know, this, you had an officer who was beaten, who was with a white partner who was brutally beaten. And in his own words, he said he was beaten like Rodney King, you know, and we, most of us are old enough to know uh, the video of um, the Rodney King beating and to have a white partner and your white partner is not touched or you have Milton Green who's black who was shot. Uh, you have other cases before that. You had the, the issues internally. Uh, what happens internally is generally going to mirror what happens externally. And police departments are just a microcosm of society. You know, it, it's like, hey, we've been saying forever that the police association has supported racism. They've supported racist officers, clearly. And, you know, people are like, oh, you guys are just, you're just loud mouths. You're just like, well, every time you look up, Everything, you know, pretty much that we've complained about has come true um, and it's been exposed for what it is. And it's like, you know, we don't want a, pack on our, a pat on our back, but it, it, if the department in the city, if these higher up commanders in the city who have the ability to make change on behalf of our community and, and our officers would have listened, maybe Luther wouldn't have happened. Maybe Luther Halls wouldn't have been beaten and settled a case for a million. Maybe Ryan Cousins wouldn't have um, settled his case for 1.1 million. Maybe Milton Green, who's probably going to receive a large sum of money and pay out as well, wouldn't have occurred. So if you address it, you know, at the command level and the city level, but you know, what well, you know, their <laughs> their um, means of addressing it is. Oh, let's give them some implicit bias. When you can't change someone who's already set in their ways and have these values. Um, you can't change corrupt officers. Suddenly, uh, they're no longer corrupt or you know robbing people on the street that they stop um, in cars or pedestrian checks. You're, you're not going to change that. Um, you have to. You have to do better at the beginning. Who you're hired, you have to have better background checks. So I guess I just went on a tangent there. <laughs> No, not at all. Not at all. We, we appreciate it. So, so, so you have these cases where you feel as though the administration is encountering um, racism within the police department and their, their solution is, you know, some implicit bias training or something, you know, very, you know, su superficial that's not going to get at them. Because like you said, if, if, if I'm a police officer who's engaging in overt acts of racism, then sensitivity training is probably not going to address it. It's so ingrained in me that, you know, it's exactly it's like you've hired. You need so. to... Yeah, well, you have people who that have these uh, repetitive behaviors. Um, we have a, a bike patrol um, downtown, fourth district bike patrol sergeant now who's still on the street. Um, and off a uh, young lady um, filed a complaint on him for um, blaming Corona. Uh, the coronavirus, in his own words, um, on uh, Asians, uh, Asian Americans out of San Francisco, specifically Asian Americans out of San Francisco are to blame, according to him, um, and reported them. She wrote up a complaint, and uh, he's at a business downtown on Washington, walked into the business, and he's around this business, and he says these things, and she overhears her, she complains, and well, she didn't know a decade before, or maybe 18 years before, he'd been put on desk duty for using the N-word, saying that he was tired of N-words, you know, uh, and 
you move forward. If you don't address it back then, you should have been fired, should have been terminated. So you move forward and you have the same sergeant, he was a sergeant then, sergeant now, he says that, and he has had multiple complaints um, about his character. But when you let it, people like that continue on your department, eventually um, there will be a payout, he'll do something or say something worse, it'll bring more discredit to the police department now. Um, that same sergeant has an active restraining order against him. You know, um, it's it, these, you can't train this way. You have to eliminate them. You have to remove them. And it's not good for those around them because a lot of these officers don't want to work with these people. Um, unfortunately, some of them are just too um, cowardly <laughs> for lack of a better, yeah, no, it's not, that's the perfect word. Um, they're cowardly and they don't stand up, you know, instead of exposing these people for who they are, they're afraid of what, you know, what will the police officers association say? What will my coworkers say about me, you know, telling on another officer that acts like this fool sergeant on bikes in district four, he's still there. Reported to internal affairs. They didn't even pull him from the street, didn't matter. Oh. Right. So people just, they just continue on and it, it, it's not addressed and, and it's sort of like a, an infectious sort of, sort of thing. Yeah. So you, so you said that, uh, you know, you, you were exposed to, to the ethical society and in, in, in the academy, but that later on, but you sort of like, didn't really, didn't think that you would need it right away. It wasn't something that you became involved in right away. And then a little bit later on in your career, how, how far into your career were you? And what, was there some catalyst? Was there some event or something that happened that made you say, you know, I really need them now? Um, I think maybe a couple of years after being on patrol, um, I was, I joined immediately um, when they told, I knew that I was going to need them because they're, you know, I have heard the stories um, so I had enough sense to join ethical, um, maybe a couple of years later, you know, I attended all the meetings, things like that. Oh, um, so right from the beginning, you, you were attending the meetings and involved. Yes. Yes. Okay. I remember immediately, um, uh, in the police Academy, like most of us, uh, African-Americans usually join right in the police Academy. Um, and so I believe I became a board member, maybe about my fifth year on the police department. Uh, became a board member once I felt comfortable with understanding police work, um, violent crime, things like that. And I was elected to their board and I was off the board um, in particular. Um, I hate that I got off the board. I didn't realize that um, Darren Wilson, <laughs> the black Darren Wilson would be a, a crook and a clown. Um, so, you know, um, got off the board for a while, but was still active as a member. Okay. Until I became the president. So. Okay, and then when you when you when did you decide to sort of push push ahead, and you eventually became president? What what what, what uh, brought you back into the fold at that at that capacity? So um, I was asked to run for president um, when we found out about Darren Wilson uh, stealing money um, from membership money and, and committing crimes. Um, we just went to internal affairs on and reported him. Uh, we had to have an election process and I ran and I won that first term and, you know, on and on and on. Um, and what, I, what year, what year was this that you, that mm, you did it? 2015, 2015, I think February of 2015. And that's where, you know, kind of, you know, where it all started, you know, inherited uh, an organization that um, was in turmoil at the time, they really were, um, well, we re really were, um, a whole new board, everything um, was put in place. The, there was actually no board. <laughs> it was pretty much um, running it without participation. A lot, of, a lot of us were just busy living our lives and never realized, because I, I, I had ran against him and I lost, so I wasn't on the board and he didn't appoint me to any auxiliary positions. I guess he knew, he's like, she's gonna be watching me watch this money. So he was like, I don't want her on there. So you um, mean someone who's breaking a bunch of laws didn't want to have a homicide exactly. detective hanging exactly. around him and keeping an eye on him? Yeah, so he, 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 he was strategic. He had a bunch of people removed from the board um, and 
the participation kind of went down. It kind of just like, and then I got a phone call. I think it was from a florist. It was like, um, when are you guys going to pay your bill? And I'm like, hmm, why are you contacting me? I don't know. Um, I don't, you know. So I reached out. I was like, oh, yeah. I reached out to him. He's like, oh, yeah, that's paid. I was like, well, are you sure? What's going on? So I start, started digging a little bit. And then I want to say a couple of months later, it came out. And we just kind of, okay, let's get them. Let's, get them. let's go down to internal affairs. We got some of the people, um, you know, and a lot of times people say that black officers, you know, um, seem to think that black officers are somehow um, the examples of what you want in law enforcement. I any officer is, is capable of being uh, corrupt and biased and, and ignorant. And I remember, <coughs> excuse me, I remember um, retirees saying, why are you, why did you guys prosecute him? Why did you go to internal affairs? And I remember looking at them like, well, I guess I just um, lost a friendship there because they, they have lost their mind if they think that uh, the right thing, uh, to the wrong thing to do, or the right thing to do was to not prosecute him and go to internal affairs. And I believe Darren was like maybe seven months away from a pension, 20 years. It's like, oh, well, good. It was even better. Was even what, better. Can you tell us a little bit what, about what he, what he had done to the, so he was like embezzling money from the organization? and Yeah, he was embezzling money. He was taking, he was basically using ethical's um, substantial amount of money that we had a, a lot of money in the bank. Thank goodness we recovered it, but he was using it for his own personal gain um, to take trips, to buy things, to, you know, rent cars, things like that. And that never happened. You know, we had, um, I think it was like 400,000 something in the bank. And by the time he was done, he had depleted it. I think he was in there maybe a year and a half, if that. And it was down to like 55,000. Yeah. So, and we, we, you know, it took a lot of um, work and cooperation. We didn't lose. We, I think we lost two board members, two, not board members, but two members. Uh, we were at like 210 members. We're at like 370 now. Um, so it, it took five years, almost six years to get us here. But, you know, it, we recovered and we prosecuted him, had to testify against some people were some of the retirees and probably some of the current ethical members were upset um, because I testified and I was like, I, I want to be the first, you know, um, no problem. So. And, and when you took over, like you saw your takeover in like February of 2015, mm -hmm. um, if uh, we remember back in Ferguson, that's shortly after the events in Ferguson and St. Louis was, there was a lot of turmoil yeah. um, and your police department was spending a lot of time um, up working the, the, the protests. Mm -hmm. Am I, am I right? Yes. Yes. It, it was, um, it was a, a difficult time all around. It still is a difficult time in the city. So. Yeah, it has been, been since, but I would imagine that that particular time frame, this, these events were sort of front and center and you guys were sort of like the fault line for America's race problem in the, in mm -hmm. the 21st century, you know, like these very old, old, um, things were coming back into pub the public. It's because they've always been happening, but they became a focal point in, in American politics. Like everyone knew where Ferguson was. Everyone knew what had happened. Uh, people were watching the news and seeing events unfold there. What was, and you have this unique opportunity to have been engaging with all of these officers as a, as a labor leader and as an accountability, head of an accountability mechanism within the police department and you're in homicide. So you really have your, your hand on the pulse of what's happening in the department. What can you talk a little bit about what, like, so what was the, what was it like for a young black officer working in St. Louis while the police become uh, you know, all this attention is being drawn to, to race and policing. I just imagine this would be a very unique experience. Can you t t tell us about some of the, some of what, what that might, might have been like? Yeah, it, it's, um, it, there were a lot of um, ups and downs, there were a lot of friendships for a lot of black officers with white officers that ended. Um, you saw um, how some people felt, really felt about your people, um, the difference in how they perceived protesting uh, 
why they were protesting. You know, these people are animals, you know, they don't have jobs when reality was very different. A lot of people were moved at seeing this African-American male just lying in the middle of the street, just discarded like, you know, his life didn't matter. And you had him killed under questionable circumstances. And you had a lot of officers that um, referred to Michael Brown as, you know, in a negative light. And I remember at the time, just like, man, these people are, some of these people are just horrible. Um, and there were some black ones as well that I just unfriended. I just like, you know, you're an idiot. Um, unfriended them. They look up, well, why do you do said Because I don't agree with you. I don't, I, I chose not to, to follow you. You're, I don't believe in your beliefs. You have no clue what it's like um, to grow up and deal with police that harass you. You know, I've been there. I understand it. And this is the First Amendment right. And our country was founded through protest, protests. It's like, this is what our country stands on, is protests uh, to express yourself. And now you're upset because uh, people are protesting over a young black male that was shot and killed by law enforcement. And we all know that some of these shootings are questionable. And it was a difficult time uh, as well from being on the inside and being black. And uh, I remember we've had several homicide scenes where we were surrounded, you know, we were literally surrounded trying to work the homicide and pushing tape back, pushing it back, you know, having people, oh, you're a sellout. It's like, okay, whatever. Um, you, you have no clue about who I am. Um, and you deal with that level of um, commentary from people that you don't know me. You don't know where I come from. You don't even realize that my aunt was murdered by law enforcement. So, you know, and so you had to deal with that as a black person, people questioning um, your blackness. It's like, how dare you, you know, don't ever question my blackness, you know, because that's something that you wear every day. I can't turn my blackness off and I don't want to. Um, and, you know, I remember hearing my friends, um, there was a protest was a, after Mike Brown, of course, at the workhouse and um, she was called a, a ball-headed black, you know what, by African-Americans out there. And you had people who were agitators saying some of the most ignorant things. And the reality is, you know, she's an African-American um, sergeant who fights for African-Americans, uh, who's an example of what you want. Um, and just that part of it was there as well. But then you had the part like her and I, who we can absolutely identify with is, you know, officers committing crimes and, and, you know, turning them in and dealing with the backlash internally. You're getting punched in the mouth internally by your chief Dodsons and your chief O'Toole's and your Colonel Rochelle Joneses who are targeting you. And then you go out and you're doing your job. And sometimes you're getting punched in the mouth by this community who doesn't understand why you want to be a police officer. And my response all the time was like to, to people, and I say it now, is that you ought to be glad that I'm an officer because this place would be much worse without us, um, uh, especially the ones like myself that stand up and fight and that, you know, put their lives on the line, you know, to do this job and to be fair for everyone because I am, I am my community, you know, just like my friend who was, um, who people said some terrible things to. And I know that protesting is supposed to be about agitation all day. I get it. Um, it should be. Uh, protests can't be violent. Uh, I'll never agree with that part of it. You know, Captain Dorn being murdered and, um, you know, people like, what is he doing out there? No, you can't go there. Um, I don't care who you are as an African-American. Don't, don't become that monster. Um, you have to own up. We have to own up to the things that are our fault. You had African-Americans who murdered him. And there are a lot of um, factors behind poverty and crime. But at the same time, somebody has to be held accountable for murdering Captain Dorn, David Dorn, just like they should be held accountable for um, the murder of Anthony Lamar Smith. You know, these are you know, Jason Stockley was an officer. He had no right to murder Anthony Lamar Smith because that was a murder, just like the murder of Captain Dorn. So you have to be able to call it all out. You can't pick and choose a side when something is wrong. 
you have to call it all out, uh, especially for us in our community. That's and that's been my belief forever. You know, I, I'll never condone any form of violence, whether it's coming from the community or officers who are committing um, violent acts against our community that are unjustified. You know, it, it, it was difficult, it has been difficult at times, but you know, I, I think I'm one of the few who I'll say it to activists, I'll say it to police officers or anyone, you know, this is how it feel. Well, whether someone likes it or not, hey, you know, I'll listen to you. I have no, no problems with agreeing to disagree, but I'm not gonna ever condone any violence, whether it's committed by an officer or um, a protester or somebody in our community. So. And, uh, and, and I would say that, you know, what you're saying, um, uh, uh, it, uh, I, I mean, that, that isn't some huge leap of belief, right? I mean, this is a very well-grounded um, uh, belief system to say, hey, look, you know, um, we're, we're, we're going to call things the, what, the way they are when when this is an issue between us and the community, then we're going to call it when it's an issue about the community looking inward to the police, we're going to call that as well. I, I have said for years, you know, um, that, you know, as a police officer, th that the big thing that I always struggled with, and, and I see it so much today, <clears throat> is this idea that somehow we the the police can't just say like we're wrong right i mean uh you know there 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 just isn't this encouragement at all to say you know to look at cases and and i and i have always felt like that this is something that would go so far um in 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 healing a lot of these wounds um between the police departments and the community as if if they just took accountability for the things that uh, you know that that are clearly wrong, what? Why do you think? Uh, and I, I know that you know we probably do a whole episode just on this, but but why do you think it is? Why why is? It, I mean, I know I'm sure liability has something to do with a little bit of it, but why is it that there's just this absolute lack of self reflection um, uh, that that spoke about? I think a lot of it has to fall on your police unions. Um, this is historically how it's been. Uh, you have police unions that stand up for members no matter what they do. Uh, and the reality is, is that if you're a member of a police association, you're guaranteed the number one thing that you're there for is an attorney. Legal representation, that's what you're guaranteed. You pay your money, but you're not guaranteed from me to say that you're innocent when I know that you're guilty and I believe you should be in jail. So I'm, if you want me to give a statement on your behalf, I might say that. So, you know, there is no set, there should be no set rule that, oh, it's always pro-police. No, sometimes we are wrong. Uh, we've had African-American members. We had one officer who did something absolutely stupid and foolish. He went to a gas station. He beat the crap out of or tried to um, assault a man in the gas station for no reason. It's like, no, I knew that officer. I, I knew his mom. I liked him. But in that moment, hey, listen here, brother. You're wrong. You need to quit. You need to be charged just like we would charge anyone else. I'm not going to go out and, and um, support you internally or externally. What I'm going to give you is an attorney. That's what you get legal representation. If you would have come to us for that, you went to a, the police association instead, but you could have come to us for legal representation. That's what you're supposed to get, but you're not supposed to get a voice internally defending um, a wrong behavior. What police associations need to do is start calling it what it is. And it's so corrupt um, that that's, that's where it starts a lot of time. That's what you see, even the insurrection uh, on January the 6th, you literally had police um, the National Fraternal Order of Police referring to them, you know, the, the insurrectionists as just citizens, as just these, um, these protesters. No, they murdered someone, a police officer, and injured hundreds of others, and, and five other people were murdered. So, you know, you can't pick and choose when something is right to say that it's right, and pick and choose when to say it's wrong. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Say it. If it's right, it's right, you know, and I understand the liability purposes with, with a lot of things, but at the same time, uh, a lot of things are, are on police unions and that mirrors, uh, then your command mirrors that, that their lead. And that's why it, it, police 
departments around the country are a hot mess right now. You see it, it it's, it's showing. Uh, this is, there, there's a problem and they fail, they refuse to really, really address it. And here we go. This is what we have, this is what we're left with. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I'm conflicted on this because I recognize the problems with a lot of the, the things that the unions do, the problems that they can cause and that the, they can be, they can inhibit positive change and there's, there's it's a lot of problems. And then at the same time, like you said, in this particular profession, you paying into to something, I mean, guaranteed legal counsel, that's, I think that's, a, that's something that needs to be there having an organization, being organizing labor so that they can fight for fair wages and medical care and all these things. Like I want that. I want all employees to have that as an opportunity. So there are these very legitimate functions that these unions carry out and they're an important part of a, a labor movement. That's, I mean, labor movement in America is in rough, rough shape. And they're sort of a cornerstone of, 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 uh, of public, public, employees you know unionizing i think it's important but then there's that line that you talk about you know like where you just can't say, try to fight for everyone and argue on their behalf no matter how stupid the thing that they did is so it's a tough uh, it's a tough path yeah i agree it is it is and so so you've uh you've taken this you have the ton of experience so you worked in a, you worked in a homicide bureau you led a homicide, a team of homicide investigators. How long were you up in homicide? Mm, I think seven years, maybe seven. Seven years. So seven years investigating homicides, it's a ton of, ex ton of experience. And then you've also worked um, for this organization that, um, uh, that a union for black officers in, a, in, in the same city for an extended period of time for, we did that for about five years, I guess. Uh, and, Six. And then six oh, years, six years, and you and you did this during this like turbulent period where uh, race and policing were coming into conflict, and you did it in the in this sort of um, the epicenter of where this was taking place. So you're you have a, like a ton of unique and very valuable experience. What are you going to do with this now? So you you just retired from policing and you move somewhere a little warmer so you're not getting hit with the ice right now. What, yeah. What's next for you? How do you, how do you get all of this crazy experience and, and move forward and contribute? Because I, I could tell you're gonna wanna serve again. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm studying for the LSAT right now. Um, I'll take it in August when they have the LSAT flex, flex um, then, uh, which will be computerized, which will be interesting. So it'll be my first time taking it uh, just digging in and studying hard. I, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I am. Oh, I'm also writing a book. Um, decided to do that. That's been that's been interesting. It's kind of weird, you know, putting uh, your thoughts on paper. Uh, it's just so much that you, I kind of realized that I've lived a, a, an interesting life more so than what you know I ever thought. Um, so that's been interesting. I'm doing that, you know, who knows when that'll happen or be completed uh, in between studying. So my one focus is my family, of course, and I have a husband, a stepson, and, you know, I'm just loving just being around them and being, you know, free to just laugh and joke and enjoy myself with them and just digging in with this LSAT and wanting to get a good score to you know, have someone pay for me to go to law school, hopefully pay for it all. <laughs> That's the goal. So. And what type of, what would you do? What would you, I know you, oh, you so, never know. I'm sorry. Civil rights. That's, that's always been my focus. Um, if there wasn't a, a pandemic, um, I know I would have by now volunteered somewhere, um, for, um, you know, helping, um, for criminal justice reform. I also, oh, I, I started my own business. I forgot all about that. My goodness, I'm so terrible. Um, started um, an LLC consulting. Um, so far I've been consulting for Ethical. I'm there. Um, they hired me as their um, consulting spokesperson and business manager. I've been doing that. That's been interesting. Um, doing some consulting on um, some different things, a movie project that's coming out, which, you know, it's like, you, know, you want to listen to me? Okay. Um, 
<laughs> so that's been so like consulting on a film, like uh, yeah. telling them how to make a make policing accurate yeah. in the film, or yeah, just accurate um, depictions of what it's like, uh, some things like that. So yeah, that's that's about it. Um, just enjoying life, really. So writing a book, going to law school, making movies, consulting with the union, that's that's about it. Nothing nothing else really big going on. Yeah, I guess I guess I guess it's a lot, but I don't know. It, it's yeah. it, it keeps me busy. I enjoy it. Good. And and so I'm sorry to just to pull on the thread with the the uh, the law the law the future in law and you said a civil rights attorney, would that be focusing on issues related to policing? Would that be something that you would focus on? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I can I can pick apart um, a police report and a story, um, and I don't want to be uh, a defense attorney or a prosecutor, um, but yeah, I can I can pick them apart. I can tell you that. So it would be if you if you felt as though someone's someone came to you. Well, I guess you're a lawyer. You take the case. Uh, yeah. Someone's make, claiming More that so. their rights their rights were violated. Yeah, pro bono work along those lines for the most part, because there is no money in it. I know that. Um, but yeah. And Graham, we're almost out of time. Do you have more for one more question? Yes. Well, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Randy. Oh, no, no. Go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to I just wanted to ask. So moving forward, we're having this this homicide spike around the country in a bunch a bunch of cities that we've had. Um, this this year, last year, and into this year especially, um, I think we can all agree that the root cause, attacking the root causes of poverty, is the like the way to solve violent crime. So it's an intergenerational project. It's investments in housing and education and medical care and you know opportunities for people and building community. All of those things. This intergenerational project. It, that's obviously what needs to happen in the short term in terms of. I think we can also all agree that when one person takes another person's life, that the state needs to intervene and, 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 and get, you know, there needs to be an investigation. There needs to be a process to manage homicide. I mean, that's, you know, a fundamental thing that needs to take place. What do you, if you, based on your experience as a homicide investigator, what do you think is the, 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 the thing that can be done now to address, um, this homicide crisis, if you if you were to say, in particular in the city, uh, I think you're going to have to get rid of the dead weight that's um, in the homicide division. People who are not solving homicides, who have no business in homicide, who are not trying to solve homicides, and it goes for, you know, there there are you know legitimately 16 great detectives, I believe, out of about 40, you know, and the rest, you know, they need to be reassigned. Uh, they're going to have to have a cold case squad um, of retirees that are investigating these cold cases because you have detectives that have 20 homicide scenes. And uh, that's the, the average is like six uh, or seven. And you can't have that. It's hard to follow up on the cases that you had in 2020. In 2019, there were cold cases that you have leads on uh, in those instances. And the police department has to make a commitment like St. Louis County is probably one of the things that St. Louis County does right, is hire your, their retirees to investigate cold cases. So in St. Louis City, who's investigating these cold cases are your current homicide detectives. It makes no sense. It's just, it's idiotic and it's, um, they're ill-prepared to handle the, the spike in homicide, even with, you know, 16 detectives that if something happened to you guys or myself, I would, they would solve it. I know that. And there are, you know, four sergeants there who bust their butts, who are great investigators and leaders, but you have to re, uh, redesign that division. You have to stop having your manpower on day watch. Well, homicides mostly occur in the evenings and afternoons and overnight, you're gonna, you can't have your most manpower on then. You have to handle cases where you have to be open um, to communicating with everyone. I remember when I was a, a sergeant there, my crew, we shared everything. We didn't hold anything. You wanted our file, it's on our desk. You want it, we send out emails updating people on a regular basis about every single homicide scene. And I had over 400 and there was a detailed email sent out on every single homicide scene. And 
this, these things have to happen. You have to have better communication internally and externally. You can't have your homicide division holding on to evidence that's important to your South Patrol detectives or your North Patrol detectives that could clear a case before it becomes a homicide. And, and it's another homicide that is. So you have these things that you can put in place, but they're not doing these things. And it's, it's a lot of ego, a lot of inexperience. And you, you know, finally, I'll say this, you can't have homicide detectives who or on your who or now on desk duty that should have never been there that had drug problems that have alcohol problems that have been um, that are currently in civil litigation for um, falsely charging someone with a crime. It's like you can't have these people in your homicide division or homicide detectives who are accused of sexual assaults. Uh, you you can't. Yeah, you know, that's what the problem is. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a long list. But I believe it's not something that's insurmountable. Uh, they can do it. Um, they have to change the manpower up and they also need to get rid of that collective bargaining agreement because it, it doesn't put your best there. You know, it usually puts um, white males in these divisions in these positions who are um, not uh, representative of the community in which they are policing. So. So there, if, are, there are things that can be done. Go ahead, Randy. I, I just I want to squeeze in one last thing on this topic because um, is uh, what about training for homicide investigators? Is, is that, I mean, you know, uh, unsolved crimes is a really huge pet peeve of mine. Uh, you know, when I see us, uh, see the police using resources, you know, messing with someone who's panhandling or who's homeless or something like that. And then I think, there's 500,000, literally 500,000 unsolved homicides in the United States um, since 1969. Um, and so part of it is resource, I know. Um, but how much is this to do with training, do you think? I think it, 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 a lot of it has to do with um, training as well. Our homicide detectives come in and they receive very little training, you know, um, on homicide investigations. And um, being in homicide, you have to be motivated as well. Um, the training is lacking. The department doesn't want to pay for it. You know, just uh, for instance, really quickly in 20, 2016, one of my officers, two of my officers, I was off work and they had a homicide scene uh, with another sergeant who covered my ship. And there were finger, it was a double homicide. Uh, there were fingerprints on the front of the car in areas where you know that just recently, whoever touched these areas recently did it. Um, less than uh, six months later, it was connected to a now 17-year-old who fled the state and went to Virginia. When we attempted to fly to Virginia to interview him, we were denied by the city and the homicide section command saying, no, we can't authorize that training. In the meantime, what happened, that young man had a gun case, then he gets a homicide case. They kept denying us. And we're like, hey, can we go to this go here and, and interview him. His fingerprints are inside of a car that had two murder victims. We go, we put in the paperwork. The city tells us, tell my two homicides that they have to pay for part of their trip themselves. They have to use their own credit card. They have to pay for it. Yes, that's true. Um, we also had a command, a colonel who said, how about you let Virginia, Virginia, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, how about you let those guys interview your homicide suspect? Well, they don't know our streets. They don't know our investigation. No, we're not going to do that. Kept fighting, fighting, fighting. We finally get to Virginia, interview him. He confesses. He names a co-suspect who's now been arrested for three homicides. So that's what happens. You create more victims when you are unorganized. You're, you have people in there that have no business being there. And you have all these problems. That we fought, we fought, we fought to get there. And finally, you let us fly. And the only reason why they let us fly there is because they had let a detective who's close with the St. Louis Police Officers Association fly out of town to go to an investigation. I got wind of it and I said, oh, you let him fly? I said, I, I finally had to tell the chief, the colonel, lieutenant, I'm gonna stand out in front of police headquarters. I'm gonna put on my ethical shirt so that I'm covered when you charge me with misconduct. And I'm gonna call every news outlet and I'm gonna let them know that you haven't, you've refused every attempt we've had to go out out of state. And the two detectives, two white males, two of the best detectives in homicide, hands down, that we, the, between the three of us, we pushed, we pushed, we pushed, we finally 
um, get to interview someone that confesses. Well, imagine if he would have confessed before his co-suspect in the first, the first double homicide had murdered three other people or before he murdered another person. So, you know, that's why. That's why the homicide rate is skyrocketing. Um, you have leadership that's non-existent. Um, people don't want to make decisions. Uh, you know, that's, that's part of the problem. And, it's good. and like you said, it's so many of these are retaliatory. You have one person kill somebody and then somebody yeah. else is killing somebody or it's, yeah, so it's, that's crazy. Thank you so much. And You're I'm welcome. sorry for taking so, for talking so much. This has been fa uh, especially fascinating. Uh, do you have any par any parting words? Any, anything you'd like to say before we say goodbye? Uh, just be safe. Put on a mask. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it and have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thank bye you, Ms. Taylor. Bye. Thank bye -bye. you.